are you fed up with being labelled a selfish baby boomer or a snowflake millennial? Or perhaps you are from Generation Z. A new book out today looks at the significance of the era in which you were born and says it's time to drop some of these tired cliches and work, work more closely across generations. The book Generations Does When You're Born Shape Who You Are? is by Professor Bobby Duffy, Director of the Policy Institute at King's College London. And earlier I brought him together with Georgia Gill Holly from Young Voices. And first, I asked the author to explain more about his book. Well, fundamentally, the book is trying to make the case that understanding generations is a really big idea that can help us understand society now and into the future. But that idea, uh, which goes all the way back to really big thinkers in sociology and philosophy about how important generations are, has been hopelessly corrupted or horribly corrupted by really terrible stereotypes, cliches, and a mix of fake battles between young and old on everything from culture wars to climate change to economic factors. And and really, the, the job of the book is to try to separate out those myths and realities, because I, I think there's, there are some real generational differences that are important for how society is being shaped now and into the future. And, and that's what I try to do, but it, it means having to discard a whole load of myths that have grown up and uh, been reinforced about how different, particularly younger generations are now. Georgia, how would you describe yourself? Are you a, are you, are you a millennial? Are you a Generation Z, a Generation X? Or do you reject all of those? Well, I'm certainly not Generation X because my parents are actually Generation X. Oh, OK. So I've got that confused. <laughs> uh, what, what is Generation X? Um, I think it's sort of between boomers and millennials. So people who are born in like the 70s. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I've been told quite recently, apparently I'm a, uh, a zillennial. So I was born in 1998. Um, mm. my brother was born in 2003 and he's sort of grown up, you know, always having smartphones, that kind of thing. Whereas I, I do remember a time before that. So I think that probably makes us a little bit distinct, but then, you know, when I was a teenager, I had social media and that, you know, that kind of. I was involved in that sort of change. So it's definitely different from, say, if you're a teenager in the very early 2000s or the 90s. Um, but yeah, I think the boundaries are always a little bit porous when it comes to these kind of things. I think especially that's a feature of, I guess, living in times when things do change faster than ever before. Yeah, and I mean, Bobby, this is important, isn't it? Because Georgia's experience of growing up in uh, an era of social media, she won't be remembering what it was like not to have a mobile phone. Um, I'm, I'm not going to give her away which generation exactly I'm going to put myself in. But I certainly, when I was a teenager, I didn't have a mobile phone. So I'm going to make yeah. that confession. And, and that does yeah. make a big difference to um, your uh, approach to, um, to society, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Gen X. I'm, uh, I'm of that era. It's actually the forgot, forgotten generation that people don't really talk about that much anymore. Um, but I, I mean, it's re- that, what Georgia says is really important on technology and the speed of change, because that, that is built into some of the biggest theories around generations, which is when society is changing quickly, um, the generations tend to develop more quickly and, and add more distinctiveness between them. But the thing that I would say is generations are not all about technology or what platform you're on or whether you had a mobile phone or uh, you know which uh, video games you played or all those types of things which is how it's often presented there's really big things that really matter when you were born so economically um if you were born in uh, the millennial generation you had an utterly different experience coming into the workplace and trying to buy a house and all of those types of things that, that really shape your life than I did just being born 10 years uh, earlier. So it's those. It's not just all about technology and that is some of the things that um, distract us a little bit about uh, generations and how they're commonly discussed is it's really big things, economic things, cultural change things um, more broadly. Um, and that's what I try to map in the book is how those types of things have affected the life course for uh, generations coming through recently. And then obviously, 
on top of the financial crisis and wage stagnation, then this generation of young Gen Z coming through now has to deal with the pandemic and all the aftermath of that. And that's that's the root of generational thinking is it's when there's a traumatic event like an economic crisis or a pandemic, in, in our case, or a war, that really shifts the experience of generations much more so than whether you're on TikTok or um, still on Twitter or whatever. And is there a, a danger as well that certain generations, certain cliches emerge, uh, particularly in some sections of the media? And I mean, there was this, a lot of talk about the snowflake millennials and all they care about is their avocado on toast or whatever, when <laughs> clearly there are a lot of those really important economic issues, the, the difficulties of getting on the housing ladder and so on. I mean, is that something that uh, you have experienced, George? Um, yes, I think that I think that there's certainly a grain of truth in those things. So you could say that some of those stereotypes about millennials are sort of there because some of their behaviours are, on a general level, a reaction to the world that's been created by the generations before them. Obviously, I wouldn't want to sort of be deterministic about it, but it is a fact. Um, I think, though, so, you know, sometimes it can be tongue in cheek, and I think that. Sometimes it works the other way around. Like, I'm sure you're familiar with the OK Boomer meme. I mean, I still say that to people. So um, it's sort of, yeah. But of course, it can, you know, when you're trying to have a serious conversation, it can maybe lead the conversation aside, if that makes sense. Because you do need to accept that, you know, you know, there are just, there are stereotypes of every kind of group of people, I suppose, Um but when it comes to, I guess, discussing age, it, it sort of transcends like economics and culture and that kind of thing. And I think that, yes, um, you know, if you're going to speak to like the average boomer or, or someone about, OK, you know, I'm trying to find a job in like a, in a, let's say like a post-industrial town in the UK, they'll say something kind of naive like, oh, you know, why don't you just go and give me your CV? Like that doesn't work anymore. I think that people... Um, if older people can be a little bit out of touch, they might be a bit naive sometimes about the way things work nowadays, which is fair enough because they obviously have a different experience. And I'm sure that in a few years' time, you know, I'll be saying things to my children that they'll think, okay, that's just not relevant anymore. So it's kind of, you know, obviously we all have stereotypes and some of them, some of them can be sort of jokey, some of them can be more serious than based on facts. But, you know, obviously if you're having an actual conversation with an individual, you need to sort of accept them as they act rather than stereotyping them, which I guess is a rule for life in general. <laughs> <laughs> and is there a danger, Bobby, that in our politics uh, there's a bit of a danger of setting one generation against another? We're hearing a big debate at the moment about, for example, the pensions triple locks and uh, mm. about the, the pension triple lock and whether uh, the government should honour that commitment, even though it would lead to a big increase in pensioners' incomes at a time when we know that a lot of those younger generations have probably been hit harder during the pandemic than many older people, though, of course, uh, an awful lot of older people actually uh, lost their lives uh, in the early part mm. of the pandemic. But in, in economic terms, um, perhaps it is the younger generations that have been hit harder. Yes, it's exactly that. And, and picking up on, on George's point as well, it is about that, that stereotyping and distraction that a lot of these things uh, lead to is, is, um, is a constant of history. When uh, you look through all sorts of different periods in history, all the way back to Socrates, and they always were denigrating young people. Socrates had a very dim view of young people, but you can see it in all different ages um, through 17th, 18th century. In, in the UK, it's always the case that the next generation is the worst generation ever. Um, the coming generation is the worst generation ever. And it's a bit of a reflection of you know, how we get stuck in our ways as we get older. And that is that, that those stereotypes and cliches and then how that leads to fake conflict between young and old um, is, is one of the big issues that we face right right now. And it does bleed into those types of debates on triple lock or uh, what, what, we should, what we should do next. I guess the, the argument of the book 
is that that is that those are really important to look at the balance between generations and the fortune that some generations have had and the misfortune of timing that other generations have had that will be amplified by the pandemic. But what you see when you look at people's attitudes and what they want to happen, it's not really a reshuffling of resources from old to young. When you ask people in focus groups and surveys and other in-depth work, what do you want to do as a result of this? People hardly ever want to take money off older people. In fact, a lot of young people, it's a priority for them to give more to pensioners. And it's it's partly to do with this uh, very unusual characteristic of age, um, because we live not in our cohorts, not in our generations. We live in families where we have very strong connections up and down. Okay. But we also know we're going to get older ourselves. So we see the future. How we treat old people now is an indicator of how we'll be treated. So we've got, yeah. we've got a lot more connection between us than the rhetoric suggests. Um, Georgia, though, do you think that we actually just need more younger voices uh, there in our politics and, and perhaps in more powerful positions in our media arguing the, the case for uh, what is happening to our younger people. I mean, do you think that that would help to address some of this? Because it does, there is often this sense that the politicians are a bit more worried about keeping the older voters happy because they're probably more likely to go out to the polling stations. Hmm. I mean, it's sort of, oh, it's a yes and no. And I mean, obviously, it's quite ironic because I'm I'm a representative of an organisation called Young Voices. So <laughs> obviously, I believe that young people should have a voice. Um, however, I think that, I think that the reality is you have more experience um, and more, you know, about you as you progress as a person, you know. I'm 23 years old. I feel like I know 10 times more than I did even, you know, six months ago. You're always learning. And I think that, just in terms of the reality of human biology and, and society, obviously, people who are in the most prominent positions, be it in the media, politics, wherever, are going to be older because they've gathered more experience. So that's never going to change, and nor should it really. Um, and I think that I think that when it comes to that, say, the triple lock on pensions, we can argue about maybe the economics of it, um, the ethics of it, whether it's the right or the wrong policy decision. Um, but I think that you know, whether or not you see certain political parties as wanting to, let's say, appease, I don't know, older people, um, I think we do have a responsibility as young people to, um, you know, try and work toward a society where people who are older and maybe they, through some circumstances, they might not be able to support themselves can do. I think that's part of living in a civilised society. Um, So, yes, I mean, there's no easy answer, especially when it comes to something like, um, pensions, which obviously are really, you know, a controversial political issue, especially right now, as we're sort of, you know, plunged into uh, economic disarray given the pandemic. Um, just very briefly, if you could, Bobby, um, how do we break down these generational differences? Yeah, well, I, I think the main risk that I see is a generational separation, not so much conflict or war. We're living more separately than we have in the past physically in our uh, it, 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 where, where we live, the locations we live in, cities versus um, suburban areas or rural areas. And that's, that used to be no age difference, but now there's a big age difference in where we live. Digitally, we're also more separate. Our digital lives are more important and we're on, older people may be more online, but they're in different places doing different sorts of things. So the main thing, I think, is making connections across generations and supporting that. We've kind of let that slip just through lack of attention. So making connections across generations and taking the second element of that is taking a longer term view, trying to embed longer term intergenerational thinking into our politics, which is really hard when we've got chronic short termism in our political uh, cycles. But there are little initiatives like Future Generations Commissioner in Wales and and lots of others around different countries which are starting to move in that direction. Can we get a longer intergenerational view that's about connecting people, not dividing them. Professor Bobby Duffy talking to me earlier, along with Georgia Gilholly from Young Voices.